Good morning, everybody. So today we will start speaking about the last topic of the course that will be user evaluation, let's say in general. And this week we will dedicate all the three hours to one kind of user evaluation, that is usability testing. That will be um, also part or of your milestone four for your project. Hmm? Then we will have next week an exercise about usability testing, and then we will cover controlled experiment that is really the last topic of the course within the user evaluation. So we are uh, moving towards really the end of the, of the course on the things that we, we cover in this, uh, in this course. So just as a recap, uh, because we covered evaluation a while ago, when we spoke about heuristic evaluation, right? So we said that back then that evaluation tests the usability, the functionality, and acceptability of an interactive system. So user interface, application, graphical user interface, not graphical user interface. Still, evaluation tests the usability, functionality, and acceptability. And then we said that this evaluation could, um, could go according to different design stage. Clearly, what you can do with a paper prototype is really different, or some of the things that you can do with a paper prototype is different from the things you can do with, for instance, a product that is developed and deployed in the world for, let's say, three months, six months, one year. Hmm? So, things that you can do are actually different. Not only in terms of the design stage, but also in terms of goal, dimension, and the technique that you can use. And the information, the things that you can learn about, about this. And we said that we should evaluate as soon as possible, and that we have different, um, different approaches for the evaluation. Uh, we have, again, said one, have seen one that is the heuristic evaluation or the expert evaluation. And also, the cognitive walkthrough is something that we can use for evaluation. And, and we said when we spoke about this slide that we can have evaluation in different places, in the lab or in the field, in the wild, with users using your system, your application for in the real life not in a constructed environment for you. Then we can involve users in various ways with experimental methods, with query methods or observational methods, so interviews, surveys, um, observation, etc. And heuristic evaluation and a mix of the thing. We can have the heuristic evaluation and then the, an interview a conclusive interview for wrapping up uh, what, we, what we have seen. And we covered the expert evaluation back then, and we also said that exist, and we are not going to cover, the automated evaluation that are very good, especially for low-level issues that are basically simulation or software-based measurement. So the software is your application, your system is doing things, and there is some software that measure what is happening. Measure if the button is large enough for a user on a touch screen. Measure which is the time to move from one button to another button, or if there is too much text, etc. And we have seen sort of automated evaluation when we spoke about um, accessibility and the WCIG guideline, which we have seen that there are software tools like in Chrome or in Firefox that automatically check 
whether you are matching or not, or respecting or not, some accessibility guidelines. So if the color in the background is enough different from the color of the text in the foreground, for instance. All, all this kind of checking that is automatical could go in these automated evaluations. It's a sort of evaluation, not with your user, not with your, with your target population, but if the goal is to test the usability, functionality, and acceptability, then also that kind of evaluation are within this definition. Mm? Because they actually check for accessibility if the system is accessible with respect to the elements on the page. Mm? And similar software can be applied for other kind of guidelines. But again, especially for low level issues, issues that can be monitored, evaluated automatically like colors or size or speed of a movement of a pointer in the page. Hmm? Uh, and this was basically what we said uh, when we spoke about heuristic evaluation. That was also a sort of introduction to evaluation and then we moved to the expert evaluation and we focus only on the expert evaluation, either through um, the heuristic evaluation hmm? or rather. Now we are not considering expert evaluation. You already are expert on expert evaluation. So cognitive walkthrough, heuristic evaluation, etc. We move now to the evaluation made by your target user. So not expert evaluation. And before doing that, we should define, see, let's say, which is the difference between an evaluation done in the lab, like you did for the heuristic evaluation, and an evaluation done in the field, so let's say, in the real life of real people doing their own activities and stuff. So each of them, as uh, we, we have seen here, that the is, there are the two places where evaluation can happen in the lab or in the field. Mm -hmm. And each of them have advantages and disadvantages, as many other things that we have said here. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them is more appropriate in some circumstances and other are less appropriate in other circumstances. So, as you can imagine, advantage for uh, in the lab evaluation of any kind could be that if you need speech, special equipment, costly equipment, you can have it because you have control of the environment. So if you need an eye tracker, high expensive or a special uh, equipment for your experiment, for measuring something, you can have it because it's, it's your place. You can structure the place as you prefer bringing in all the material that you prefer. And vice versa, it's more difficult to have specialistic um, equipment in, a, in, the, in the wild or in the field evaluation. Because it's people with their own devices, with their own material doing uh, stuff in the world. So it's less controlled the, in, the, in the field, in the wild, environment evaluation. Uh, so this is clear an advantage for in the lab. You have all the equipment, you can set up everything as you prefer, as you need. You can construct the best possible scenario that you want to construct. And another advantage is that is an uninterrupted environment, meaning that you can really have your task five tasks, 10 tasks, whatever, in a row. Hmm? So you can have task number one, task number two, and then decide that after there is task number three and there is no uh, difference, hmm? there is no interruption. You decide the order, you decide when to interrupt or not. Hmm? Because you are making up all the thing for, for the evaluation. However, the disadvantage is clearly that you lack of context. 
the context that may happen in the real world because you are recreating an environment, recreating a situation that could be good enough, but not perfect, not realistic, not 100% real. It could be realistic, but not real. So you lack all the context that may happen because you typically have one person in front of a computer or in front of a device doing stuff, doing things in the lab. While in the field, this person could be outside, indoor, with other people, with some noises, with other distractions. So all of these could have an impact on your interactive system, on your user interface, on the usage, on the usability, on the perceived, at least, usability of the system that you cannot really recreate in the lab. So this is clearly a disadvantage. If you are more interested about the context or some edge cases, then in the lab evaluation are limited in this perspective. And also another disadvantage is that it's difficult to observe several people cooperate. So if you are doing a system that is based on cooperation and needs multiple people working together at the same time, well, in the lab, it's more complex because you have to figure out a way to have multiple people uh, interacting and then they should also maybe speak one another and you, you want to keep everything more controlled so maybe they cannot speak too much or you have to select people carefully, etc. Hmm? So this is a dis another disadvantage. On the opposite, in the field, you have basically the opposite, really the opposite. What is a disadvantage for the in the lab becomes a possible advantage and vice versa. So the evaluation is that in, in the field, the advantages are that you keep the natural environment. You are seeing using your, um, let me think about one of your projects that I don't in this moment. Uh, you are seeing how the person in a house split actually their things to do, their things to buy. Because you are giving to this person living together the application and they are using it for three weeks, for one month, not for 15 minutes in a, in a room, but in their real, ex the real experience, in their real homes, hmm? and possibly multiple groups also together. So you have the natural environment and the context is retained. You still have all the context. Well, if you also observe, you might alter the context, but if you don't observe because you are maybe recording what happens automatically, the interaction that happens on the phone or you're asking the user to do some diary hmm, or some survey, so without people observing, you can also re retain the context, what happens in the daily life, the issues that people have, hmm? the bad news and the good news that they receive, etc. Uh, disadvantages, on the other side, are that you can have your user more distracted, you can have more noise in the environment, in the data, in what happens. And for instance, if you are de developing a mobile application, you can have also the interaction with other application installed on the phone or also technical problems hmm, in the field according, for instance, to the version of the mobile OS that you are using or the brand of the smartphone that the person has. While in the lab, you have just one phone the one that you provide to the user. And it's the same for everybody. Hmm? So, in the lab, more control, absolutely more control, but this additional control removes context, remove naturalness. In the field, you have a more natural environment, clearly, but you can have other disadvantages, like distraction. So, when it's appropriate to do one, and when it's appropriate to do the other. In the lab, clearly they can also be do together. So one and then the other. So you can start with the in the lab 
experiment and then also do a in the field experiment maybe one month later hmm? so it's not they are not really in a position hmm? they are different they can teach you different things some things that are similar other that are different about your system and your application hmm? they are two kind of evaluation but they are again they have again some advantages and some disadvantages so if you can do both it's fine you probably get a lot more information but if, uh, if you have to choose hmm, which is best in that moment for you for your application for your system in the lab experiment are really appropriate if the system location is dangerous or impractical hmm? if you want to do for instance something in the space like astronauts on the moon hmm, in the sp that space then probably uh, in the lab experiment is easier because you can control everything and you can also assume that some things happen in some way than not moving everything on the, the international state of station and also is appropriate so that is an extreme example but in all the cases in which the system is dangerous or impractical to use clearly in the lab have a great advantage and it's also appropriate if you have a single user system. So one person interacting with one application so that you can control all and check all the cases that you want. You can systematically check that the user is doing maybe everything that is possible to do with your application or system. So you can really check everything, looking for, again, looking for issues in the usability in the functionality and the acceptability hmm? which is again the main goal of the evaluation in the field are instead really really appropriate for longer study hmm? when the usage of application can change the habits of people or if you want to see if something changed hmm? and when where the context is extremely important if you're doing an application for a waiter, one thing is testing that application in the lab, one thing is testing that application in a restaurant where this person work. Because in addition to your application, this person will also have to actually do the work. So we'll have customer, we'll have the, the other people, the telephone ringing, etc. In the lab, everything, all of this doesn't happen. Clearly, context for that kind of application is crucial because you want to, let's say, support a waiter in doing better something in their job. And you can check the usability of the system of the application in the lab, but in the field that you can really assess, for instance, the acceptability, whether this application will be something really useful or one more thing to keep in mind for the waiter. And so, ultimately maybe the waiter will stop using it because it's too much work with respect to the benefit that this application brings hmm? so these are the main differences again they are not in opposite you can have an evaluation in the lab and an evaluation in the field hmm? but they also teach you different things hmm? and they are more suitable for some kind of application and the other there is another project uh, um, i think yours that is about uh, learning how to study, right? Um, something like that. So, yeah, organizing the session of study for exams. And also that uh, in the field could be to give much more, uh, let's say much richer information than in the lab because you can experiment with students stu studying during the session and multiple session and see if there is a learning um, on the part of the, of the student how to be to organize better uh, the, the study and let's say losing in that in that sense um, losing uh, interest or attachment to the application because the user the person is learning how to do things without the need of the application at a certain point hmm? so that could be one thing that is really well suited for the field hmm? as an evaluation more than in the lab then also in the lab can 
clearly, again, teach you something about the usability of your application. Okay, so this is well. You can do that in the lab or in the field, not together. One or the other, one or after the other. Hmm? Then, let's say how. And we have basically two main categories for user evaluation. Hmm? Again, where the user is a non-expert. So it's expert of the domain in which the application run, is not an expert of HCI, is not an expert user interface, et cetera. So it's not the same user, the same evaluator that you will get for an heuristic evaluation. And these two ca categories are the usability slash user testing that, as the name said, is mostly oriented to get usability issues and the controlled experiment. Hmm? So the idea behind uh, the usability testing is that, is that one reported in, the, in, the, in that sentence. Let's find someone to use our application system, whatever, so that we'll get some feedback on how to improve it. Hmm? So let's get a bunch of people and let's have a try of our application, our system for these people, and let's see where, where are the problems. Hmm? So it's mostly anecdotal. You see what happens. Hmm? And it's clearly observation driven. You give the user your application, your system, and say, use it, more or less, in a more structured way, but the idea is that, use it. And then you look which are the problem. You ask information, maybe with an interviews after using the, the application. Very, very anecdotally. Hmm? And this is what we are going to speak today and in the next lecture. Control experiment are instead scientific and driven by hypothesis. You, in control experiment, make a bet. Hmm? You say, we want to verify if user of our application perform a specific task faster, easier, with fewer error, whatever, hmm? so something that you can compare, than our competitor app. So my application is faster than yours and I'm going to measure in doing that specific task, not any task, in doing that specific task. And I'm going to measure that in a scientific way, applying mathematical methods to understand if this is faster, is by chance, or is it's really faster for everybody, let's say in the world, in theory. Hmm? And then, but notice the difference. Usability testing, oh, let's find a bunch of people that try our application. Control experiment, I want to know if feature A, or if my application in doing that specific task is better in some sort, measurable sort, hmm? so faster, less errors, but something that can be counted, then another version of the application, another application, Etc. It's always a comparison on a very specific thing. So we are going to speak about, for now, usability testing. That is also something that we are going to ask you to do. Control experiment is something that we are going to see, is something that we are going to see an example, also a practical example, but is something that we are not going to ask you to do in the, for the project, at least. So, usability testing. Uh, as the name said, the main goal of usability testing is getting an application that is more usable in the end. 
who are the participants of usability testing? Are the ones that represent your target population? Hmm? So you're doing usability testing with those that would be the actual user of your application. Hmm? And by having some attention, hmm, some point of attention, you're recruiting this per these people. Hmm? And maybe you want to vary to change a bit among the target population that you recruit, as actually you did for also the observation, et cetera, uh, some factors. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the experience with the task could be something that you want to consider in usability testing. Mm -hmm. So users that are really expert in doing a specific task versus users that are really novice in doing that same task. And something goes in the middle, so you can also vary and choose. Hmm? Avoiding to generalize. If you have a usability testing with all expert people, expert in the task people, then you can say, oh, this is easy to use for everybody, because you just tested with expert for the task. Hmm? So people that knew the task very well, they did it 1,000 times they probably could benefit of your application system, but they already do the task, they're already expert on that thing. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, you can have novices that maybe never did the task before, or maybe just once or twice, and they can have a really different perspective from the, the users that are expert on doing that actions. Uh, background in computing could be also relevant in some cases. Hmm? Maybe you don't want all, depends also on the domain, but maybe you don't want people too much expert on computing, on developing, because they can say, okay, maybe they focus more on technical aspects and, more and less on usability aspects. Hmm? Uh, but again, it also depends on the specific application. And also, motivation, education, and ability with the natural language used in the interface. Hmm? So why? If a user, if you are doing a, an, an application for reducing the usage of social media, hmm? and if you are taking all people that are already interested in reducing their time, and that they already have some strategies or tactics to reduce their time on social media, and then you ask them, do you appreciate the application? Then probably the answer will be yes, because they are already interested in the topic, really, really strongly interested in the topic. I instead, if you take people that have no strong motivation in reducing the time and give them an application, and then if they say, yes, this is really helpful, and help me to better understand that I'm wasting too much time on social media, for instance, then that sentence, this is the same sentence of the first group, is actually more powerful for your application, for the acceptability and the, let's say, usability, uh, in the sense of usefulness of your application, or your system. Hmm? Because they are people that are not motivated in doing that already. Hmm? So also in this case, you probably want to balance a little bit things, or maybe you want to focus more on one group of people or the other. But then, keeping in mind these differences, mm, avoiding to generalize things that cannot be generalized. Mm. And same things for the education, and same thing with the ability, with the languages in the application. Mm. But again, all of this is very, very close. I would say 100% close. The, it's 100% the same, actually, than what we said about target population back then when we spoke about observation and need finding, etc. Mm. So also there, you didn't want people too, mean, too, mo too motivated or too less motivated, or you wanted both mm. in some cases. And so here, the same things are to be kept present. Because again, we are recruiting people to use a system. So in the need finding, we were looking for uh, 
people using probably another system. In our case, another system, but an already existing system and already existing process. Now we are looking people using our own system, but still we are recruiting people to evaluate something, to use something, to understand there which are the needs, which are the problem, and here which are the problem to be fixed. And if what we did actually answer to that need that we identified before or not. But the person, the people component is still the same. Then usability testing typically, so historically, brings to the building of specific ad hoc usability labs that are not mandatory to, to do any kind of usability testing, but clearly help. And they also are structured in a way similar to how a usability testing works. And so here you have a picture of this usability lab, one of the usability lab. So the part here, this is, there is a glass here, a glass like in the, in the movies for police. You see what happens in the other room, but the other rooms don't see what happens in yours. So this person here can see everything, but this person over the glass don't see that, the per that there is someone here and what is doing here. So it's a big room, let's say, split in two. There is the testing room when, where the test is actually happening with all the needed equipment. So in this case, it's just a computer. It, it's seen just a computer, but uh, you hear there is also a camera, uh, et cetera. So all the equipment that you need. And then there is the observation room where the person, the, obser the evaluator, obs sorry, the observer observe what is happening. So this person see the, the face of the person that is using the system other picture of the room, what, is, what this person is doing on the screen, etc. Hmm? So it, it really observe like it was here on the back of the evaluator. Just that is not there, it's another room. Hmm? So that it's, it's an observation in a way. And this testing room is typically smaller than the other room. Uh, while the observation room, um, it's larger and can hold the facilitator and other people looking at all the screen and taking uh, notes, etc. But here you can see already some elements of usability testing. There are one person at a time for a single user application that tests that using that is using the application. You have at least one observer facilitator that is observing, guiding the test, etc. And this observer should also take notes. You see here, probably not too much here, there is a microphone. So the observer, can, the facilitator, that in this case is also the observer, can say, okay, now do that. Or please move to the next task or you are out of time, or thank you, we are done. So it's actually instructing the person in the other room to do what to do, to, to tell her what to do. So you don't need a usability testing, a lab like this for doing usability, but you have to keep the ingredients, let's say. So you, you, should, you will have an observer and or a facilitator, and you will have a tester that will test uh, the application, the system, with all the equipment that you will need. So which are the three steps of the usability testing? The three main steps, and then we are going to see them uh, one after the other. The first, probably most important step is the planning. So decide, as for the need finding, who are your participants? 
who are you going to recruit for evaluating your application? How many? What are you going to test? To test? All the application, a part of the application, a subset, where? Hmm? In the lab, you said. And what we need in that room? Do you need cameras to video record? Do you need recorder for the audio recording? What do you need? Which is the equipment that you need? Hmm? So how you are going to do this test? Which material do you need? You need a smartphone, you need a, a computer, you need both. Mm -hmm. And uh, so planning and which information you are interested in. So you are testing one page of your web application because you are interested in getting which information from that page, from that usage. What are what you're planning to learn? Usability problems, yes, but in particular, which one? Hmm? Which are could be interested in specifically in that page? Hmm? Because maybe the page has ten different actions, but you bet that one could be more problematic than the other, or that you want to explore what happens when the user needs to move from one page to another to another. So a longer process, not just one page. So planning, decide what you want to do. Hmm? Keeping in mind the theories, the guidelines, the principles, etc., in deciding what to do. And this is the, the say the, the hard part: deciding what to do and how many people, etc., where to do, etc. Hmm? So if you are for instance, in a company, the where has probably, and the when, has probably an impact. Because in this case, you need to bring people in your company. So you need to schedule a time and an hour that works for you, that works for the participants, and that works for the place that you are going to use for performing that testing. And you, have, and you have to add everything ready for the evaluation before the first evaluation. So planning and preparing is really the fundamental part here. Then there is, let's say, the long but easy step that is running the usability testing. It's easy because you have planned everything. So you need to do what you planned. So you pick one person at a time, and you bring this person in the room, if it's a lab experiment, like typically is for usability testing, and add the session for this person. So 50 minutes, let's say 20 minutes, and then this person leaves, and you get another participant doing the very same thing. So if you have 10 participants, you're doing the same thing 10 times. So easy, long, because you need to repeat that 10 times, and probably you cannot put every participant one after the other. Maybe one participant is available today, in the afternoon, and then the next participant will be in three days. And you are there, waiting for three days. You cannot continue in the usability testing because you need another participant to continue and the participant is available just three days later. So it's long for that, it's time consuming for, for that reason. So you have one participant at a time, multiple session, uh, until you complete your set of participants and in the running you clearly collect data about the interactive system or the interface. And some data will be just the observer that is observing what's happening. Other data maybe will be automatically collected, like how many errors, how many times the user click here instead of there. How, 
how long it took a specific action. I mean, it's a very fast-paced action that needs to be completed in one second. And so you bet that you, you need to have that action completed in one second. Hmm? So you can collect data about time for completing that session. And you can do it automatically by instrumenting your software to record timestamps so that you can check whether or not precisely the user, your participants, how, many time, how much time it uses for performing that action. It's one second, great. It's 10 seconds, this big issue. It's 1.5 seconds, maybe we need to improve something, but not too much. But still, there is a problem. If this is a time-sensitive operation, so collect the data, run the experiments, collect data, and then finally, you have done all the experiments, all your participants, you have all the observation, pictures, video recording, audio recording, etc., and then you can analyze the results. Put all the, let's say, 10 participants together, all the results from the 10 participants, and see what happens. What happened, actually? extract the information for all this data, both qualitative data, like interviews that you can do after each usability testing, or quantitative data, like number of errors, time spent, etc. So these are the three main steps. Let's start from the, the most difficult one, planning. So, again, choose First step, choose who you will involve in the test. So which is your target population? Which are your target user? And this is the same thing that you have done for need finding, as I said before. So no need to repeat how to perform this. But these are the target population, your user, your ideal or not, user of the application that you are deploying and creating. Then, how many participants do you need? Hmm? So the short answer by Nielsen, again, is five. You need five participants of usability testing, a well done usability testing, well planned. Usability testing will give you a lot hmm, of information. And after five, you just have a small increase in this information that you have, in the usability problem that they catch. Hmm? So similarly to heuristic evaluation also in this case. So at least five participants. If there are 10, it's fine, clearly. But you know that after five, there will be probably a lot of overlap. It's probably, if you have 10 people and time available, it's probably to do two steps, two rounds. Five people, first round, then let's fix the problems and then let's do another round with five people. So that they can see, you can see both if the original problem was solved and there are still some other problem that may be your changes introduced. So at least five. Uh, for, for M4, I think that we are going to ask you less than five people. Then, so you have chosen your target user. You have chosen how many participants you are going to recruit, and then you need to decide who and which role you are the evaluator, are the planner of the usability testing are going to play. So, as in the picture of the usability, lab, the usability testing lab, you need at least one facilitator of the session. One person that, as the name said, facilitate the work of the tester. Because in this case, differently from, let's say, heuristic evaluation, you have to guide the user to what they have to do. You are going to create tasks for them, and you are going to give them those tasks. Hmm? So you are going to facilitate this. 
you are giving them tasks, you are maybe stopping them if too much time is spent on a single task, etc. Mm? So there is a facilitator that actually interact with the participants because they are experts on the domain, not on the application, not on the user interface. So you need one facilitator and you need other one, two people mm, that serve as note taker and observer. Mm, so that collect qualitative data that see what happens mm, for all the participants. Uh, because maybe the participant don't say anything, doesn't say anything particular on, a, some, on an application. Maybe the task is completed correctly, but mm, maybe the observer noticed that the user in completing the task, all the user or most of the user in completing the task, they click maybe some, in some part of the interface that is wrong. And then they come back from the terror automatically and click on, let's say, the new, the correct part, on the correct button. And if this happened to five participants out of five, it's clearly not something that the task is wrong because the task is completed. Maybe there is just one error per task, but it's also it's the same error for every task. So that could be an indication that something is wrong. Maybe the name of the button, the position of the other button should change. And this is not something that you learn immediately from the tester, but you learn by serving. And Maybe also the server can ask after, hmm? notice that and ask after the testing why you did that. Maybe it's to get, the, oh, I, 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 I clicked there because I thought that was the right place due to the name of the label of the button. And so it, clear, it makes clear that and all, all the five participants say the same thing, so it's really strong uh, indication that the name of the, the wrong button is a problem. Hmm? So a facilitate, a tester, a person that is testing the system, a facilitator and one, two people that serve as note taker. Hmm? And we are going to ask you for and for this exact click. One of you will work as facilitator and the other will work as observers and note takers with one difference between a real usability testing and our, let's say, prototypical uh, usability testing is that developers, designers, creators, so everybody involved in the creation of the system of the application must not serve as facilitator. Possibly, they shouldn't even be involved in usability testing, but especially not as facilitator. That's for a very human reason, that if it's my application, I know how it works. And if the user, if our participants, makes the same error again and again and again, I can be in inclined to say, no, you have to click there, because you know where to click. Or if there is a specific error that happens, you know what the meaning of that specific error. And so you are prone to give suggestion. Instead you don't, you don't need to. You cannot. So you are introducing bias, you are introducing knowledge in the usability testing because it's your thing. It's a thing that you are designed, you are created, you are developed. So you know how it works. Usability testing are typically done by other people that are not in the developer, development design team. Just to avoid, even if one is the best person in the, in the world, just to avoid that this may happen. Hmm? Because if you don't have one of the team doing the facilitator, you cannot have this situation. Because also the facilitator is not an expert of the user interface like a developer or a designer has, that knows a designer or, or developer knows why that button is called in that way, knows, knows why you choose the specific color, knows a lot of things that a person that see a user interface for the first time doesn't. And, and, and the goal here is just to understand if all those choices were good choices or not, 
and at which extent they were good or not. Mm? So the more you can have the participant to explore and understand and try and use the application as the participant wants, mo the most information you can get from that, the most clean information you can get from this A-B-C testing. Mm? So you have deciding your target user, you have decided to recruit five people among your target user, you decided who were the facilitator and the, the other role, then what you need to do, still need to do, is before doing the, the test, is choose which task you're going to ask your participant to perform. So it's not here it is a user interface, good luck. But it's more guided. Hmm? So there are tasks that you are going to decide. Hmm? And typically these tasks are between five and 10. They are not strict number. If they are 11 or 12, it's fine. Hmm? But they are a limited amount of a task typically around five to 10, not to make the test too long, mm? the session too long, so not to have fatigue within. Mm? And task must be concrete and with a clear goal, and typically depends, and clearly also depends from the specific application. You cannot generalize a task. Mm? An application for dog sitting, will have tasks totally different from an application from uh, studying at the university level. Hmm? And in some cases, tasks may be introduced with a scenario. Hmm? So you are introducing the context in which all those tasks are happening. Maybe you are asking the user to do a, an imagination, let's say, exercise, hmm? thinking not to be in the lab, but thinking to be in the office, at home, in a park. Hmm? So imagining to use that in that context. Or that you are in a, let's say, smart home with sensors, cameras, automatic doors, etc. Because maybe the application needs, will present you all this information. Hmm? Maybe the application will have a, a map of a park and you have to imagine to be in that park because you are geolocalized in that park, even if you are in a room, not in the park. Hmm? So many times the tasks are introduced with a, this kind of scenario. Hmm? So creating the context for which the application and the task will unfold. Hmm? So you need to have a, a list of tasks. And then if you want, this is not mandatory, and let me do this, because I see this as a very frequent error. Hmm? You can use some methodology, or none. Hmm? So no methodology is fine. Hmm? Uh, so in, in, in the last years, in the last year actually, uh, basically all uh, M4 usability testing use it think aloud, even if when it's not, we're not appropriate to use it hmm? as a methodology. So it's not mandatory to use a methodology, but you can for some task, if you want, if it makes sense to use one methodology or not. It's also fine not to use a methodology. Hmm? And it's not um, for all tasks you can decide that for some specific task, you're going to use a specific methodology, but only for those three tasks. And for the other seven, you're not. Hmm? So after creating your task, you should ask yourself for each task, do we want to use a methodology for this task or not? And if the answer is yes, you have to ask, ask yourself which methodology. And we are seeing the two main methodologies that are used in, uh, for task level for usability testing. 
hmm, that are think aloud and the cooperative evaluation. Mm -hmm. Now, in a few slides. So, to recap, you have identified your target population, five people, you have decided who among you is doing what. We have a list of, let's say, eight different tasks. You have chosen that for task number one, three, and eight, you are going to use Think Aloud, and for task number two, you are going to use cooperative evaluation, and for the others, you are not going to use anything. And the last thing that you have to do, almost the last thing that you have to do, one of the last things that you have to do, is to define the failure and the success criteria for each task. Hmm? So a task is successfully 100% complete if fill the phrase, hmm? complete the sentence. Hmm? So if your task is, let's make an example. Um, find a place, uh, book, let's say, book a place in room 70 today at 1 p.m. That could be a task. Hmm? And you can say the success criteria for this task is that the user is able to book the room at the specific time and the specific date. But maybe in your application, you are good, let's say you are some reason to be good actually, but let's say that there is a reason to allow the user that the task is completed, in your opinion, even if the user booked this room for the right time, but not in the right date. So maybe for you, for your application, this is still success for the task. Maybe not 100% success, maybe 90% success, but still success, because the user was able to book the room. And you were more interested in the functionality of booking the room than not the specific details. That clearly cannot be successfully completed because the details are, were missing. So that things could, could tell you that, I don't know, if the user is not selecting the right date, maybe the selector of the date was not visible enough or usable enough. So identify a problem with the date selector, but not with functionality per se. So that could be a success criteria. Another success criteria could be the user is able to complete the task in three seconds. So if the user takes four seconds, the, the task is not successfully complete. Again, maybe that task is time sensitive, and you need to be completed in three seconds. Because it's something for a doctor in an hospital, and you cannot waste one minute to, to have something that is critical. So you, you have really a time attached to that. Hmm? That could be a, time, a critical time, or you can also have something like, the task is failed, is not completed in three minutes. Because you estimate that the task should be completed maximum with errors in one minute. So you are saying three times that time. And if after three minutes the user is not com is, has not completed the task, you mark the task as failed. So there is a huge problem there. If that happens for all the participants. And you say to the user, to the participants, thank you. Next task. Because the task in that moment is failed. And you can also combine this criteria. Again, strongly depend from the application, from the target population, and from the task and the context in which the application should be used. The last uh, five things. Decide whether you need or want any additional information about your participants hmm? or about 
what the, the user, the participant is doing. This could be information before or after the test, the entire session for a single participant. Hmm? So example of things that happen before the test could be a questionnaire. For keeping track of the level of education, you have a master degree, you have a bachelor, you are a high school student, you have, in, uh, you have completed primary school, etc. The age, the gender, hmm? more, let's say, biographic information. The, the experience with computers, with tablet, with your specific task. You are a frequent user of this, uh, this kind of application or you are a novice user of this kind of application. After the test, information that you can get, you can ask after the test are typically other questionnaire about the application. On a scale from one to five, how much do you find the application usable? How much you find the application acceptable? How much you like the application, et cetera. So other information that are not related to specific problems, specific tasks, but are more general on the entire, let's say, application before and or after each task. This is used really, really rarely. Hmm? But there are, for instance, questionnaire after task, after task questionnaire. Hmm? We are going to see one uh, on Thursday. Hmm? Uh, one question questionnaire that is thought to be done after each task. Just one question on one to five about the specific task in general. Hmm? Rarely used, but yet you have to decide whether you want or not to ask and apply this. And similarly, before and after a meaningful group of tasks. Hmm? Maybe you have some tasks more related to the user profile, other tasks more related about another part of the, another set of functions of the application. Or maybe you want to change context. Maybe you have the first five tasks uh, about the application in a park, and the other five tasks you move, and you are in another part of the park, so you, you need to introduce another scenario, give another context, because you want to experiment something, another perspective, hmm? another, kind of, another type of user of your application. So all of these things are things that you have to decide and to think about specifically according to each application. There are not general rules. Mm -hmm. And they are clearly linked to the task that you created. Then select which equipment you will need mm -hmm. with respect to the criteria methodology you define. You need to video record everything, audio record, keep track of times, so you need to change your user application to log everything with a timestamp or log specific part with a timestamp. Or saying that after clicking on a button, something will happen, hmm? even if automatically. And you build that, you modify the application for experimenting that case, that specific message, that specific portion. Because you are in the lab, you are building the environment, the context in which the user is. So maybe you need to change something, bring new equipment, hardware, or change software. And most importantly, before starting everything, prepare to give before starting everything an informed consent form for participants. So that each participant say, can say, yes, I'm going to go through all this test that is testing not me, but the application and the system, and all my data will be keep private, anonymous, respecting the privacy, etc. And if the, user, if the participants don't fill and sign that piece of paper, you cannot do the usability testing. You don't have the permission 
to collect any kind of information from the participant. So you have just lost a participant and you have to recruit another one. Hmm? So this is something you have to prefer in this moment. Other things to decide. Decide whether to have a debriefing session after the test with a single participant. Hmm? So after all the tests, you can keep the participants in the room for other five, 10 minutes and ask questions by voice. Hmm? Maybe our question that emerged from something that the observer noted or something that the facilitator noted or something that happened for the last three participants, but not this one, so you want to understand why, etc. Hmm? If you want to have or not. Typically, uh, the briefing session exists, hmm? almost, always. You have a debriefing session after a test, but you can also decide not to have them, because maybe the test is very, very long, or you have a lot of questionnaires, after task, after test, and you don't really want an immediate debriefing session. And this is all you need to prepare, to decide. The last thing that you need to prepare is what is called a script. That is the written test protocol that includes everything that you decided, like a manual, of use hmm? that serve two goals. The first one is consistency among sessions. You are going to use, to follow the same step-by-step -step path with all the participants in the same way. So you are, you are ensuring consistency. That all participants will receive the same information in the same order the identical information. And the second thing is, is for you to keep track of what you did, to keep track of what you need to measure, so to see also, also if there are some gaps, mm -hmm. to, to remember, okay, now we have to, re to, to start the recording with the camera. Mm -hmm. So for the facilitator also to have something actionable as a reminder to what the facilitator needs to do. And this is often down, written down to the exact words that the facilitator will say to ensure consistency. So the script typically say, hello, my name is, and you are here to experiment this, this, and that, and now I'm going to give you an informed consent form that you have to fill, and now I'm going to give you a questionnaire, and now, I'm going to present you a scenario that is said this, 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 and that. So the real, the, the real, the exact words that the, the facilitator will say to everybody, so that it has, it is sure, the facilitator is totally sure that every participant will receive the very same information in the very same order. So one participant will not receive more detail than the other all the participants will receive the same detail, the same amount of information, in the same order. And in this script, typically the appendix contains a table with the task and the metrics and the success criteria and the failure criteria, etc. Then in the planning, and then we, we will go depth on some elements in this planning that we have seen, you can, before doing the running the real test, uh, it's always a good idea to practice the script with some friends or some colleague hmm, to simulate a usability testing with someone that you know to fix bug. Either in the script, something that is unclear, that you thought it was clear, but another person doesn't understand well. Hmm? So you can rephrase some sentences to be more, to be clear, or to fix some bug in the application. If you are doing some task in a same or in, in a certain order, and maybe if you do task three and task four in order, then 
a narrow reference, but only in that case, because some edge cases that you didn't consider. Hmm? So if you experiment that once, twice, with some people, you can identify that and fix before running the actual study. Because if this happens at the end of the first evaluation with the first participants, you have lost one participant because you cannot continue the, the test from that moment on. Because the application crashed and you, you maybe have lost data or you have to restart everything from scratch, etc. So you're using time, using information, and changing the condition of the evaluation for that participants. So now let's go in deep for the main things that we mentioned, like the, the task, the informed consent form, the measure, the equipment, so things that we exemplified, the script, but we didn't go that in this moment. So all these things are things that you need to decide. Who are user, many, which task, the methodology, the equipment, etc. You have to keep in mind all of that in creating the script, before creating the script, while creating the script. Do we have the task? Yes. Do we have success failure criteria for all tasks? Yes. So you can use them as a checklist. I have identified the target population, yes. I know how to recruit people, yes, no, etc. Hmm? So the first thing that after greeting your uh, participants in a user, in usability testing, or in any kind actually of a user, um, uh, user evaluation, or when you get information from a user, this apply also for surveys is asking the consent form. Not a, and it's called informed consent form. Because it's a form, typically it's a piece of paper, if it is done physically, in which the user is informed on which information you are going to get and which rights the participant has. And what happens during the test. So it's informed and it needs to give the consent. The participants say, yes, I agree. And typically sign this piece of paper. And you have to keep this piece of paper. Hmm? And if the participants say no, again, you need to say goodbye to that participant and recruit another one. Hmm? Because without the consent that is informed, consent, you cannot proceed with any kind of user evaluation, not only usability testing, also survey in theory, also an interview, if you are collecting data from the user. So this is in part a, a professional ethics practice and in part is regulation, in part is requested by the GPDR in Europe. Not everything is requested by the GPDR, because there are cases which the GPDR is, if you are not asking sensible, let's say, information to the user, you have less to worry. But still, the participant in this case need to be informed what happens, and which are, again, his right or her right. So you have to ask all participants before starting the test, just after saying, hello, you are going here to do this. First thing, before the first questionnaire, before showing the interface is, here is the consent form. Read it and sign it, if you agree. Hmm? And this form, you have to ask participants to read, understand, and sign a statement that say these five things. I have freely volunteered to participate in this experiment is not forced to, against his or her will. Hmm? And in most of the case, this is totally reasonable, right? You're recruiting a participant that's freely volunteered, not because you go picking this person home 
and bring him with force in a place. Hmm? You ask, do you want to do this? And this person will say, yes, so it's free to volunteer. But again, in some cases, for some application, this could be really important. Think about uh, medical application or context in which violence exists. That could be also sensible, like a to a to as, a as a topic or the context in which you are including the, the, the volunteer. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I have a free volunteer to participate in the experiment. Second, I've been informed in advance what my task will be and which procedure I will follow. So I, I, what, what is happening in the, in the, in the study? Mm -hmm. You're going to use application for 50 minutes, you will have 10 tasks on a computer, and you are, we are going to test you, the application, not you, etc. I have been given the opportunity to ask questions before and after, and so during the, the entire experiment, and have had my question answered to my satisfaction. So if before signing it, the, the, the participant has a question for you, and you answer this question, but this person had the chance to ask questions before starting. Hmm? Uh, and again, if you are thinking about software, it's kind of reasonable, easy to answer yes to all this, but if you imagine hardware, if you imagine other kind of constraints or context, some of these can be challenging hmm, to answer yes or no. I am aware that I have the right to withdraw consent and discontinue participation at any time without consequences, basically, on my future treatment. I can start a test and then at a certain point say, I am uncomfortable with this test. I want to leave. And this is a right of the participants, that they can leave. And finally, my signature below may be taken as affirmation that all the above statement and it was given prior to the participation to the study. So first thing, ask this consent form. Hmm? And then if you ask for sensitive information, if you video record the face of people, hmm? then you have to ask permission to recording and storing that information because they are, and not reusing maybe this information to create some memes or to create some fun videos on YouTube that are against the participants hmm? because you are recording things for one goal one scope and you cannot reuse that for totally different to blame the user to bully the user hmm? so this is a fundamental important part for many kind of application especially the one that let's say the general purpose like the one that you have created this is typically trivial because it's nothing really dangerous, it's not a situation dangerous, it's not something that you are collecting data for months, etc. But this informed consent form is really important, not only for usability testing, also for control experiment, also for survey, not only for in the lab experiment, but especially for in the wild, in the field experiment, where maybe you are collecting user navigation data for one year, browsing navigation data for one year. And so you need to, to be careful hmm? what you want to do with this data, what to ask this data for, and what the user is knowing, hmm? what, what, which information is giving you and why. Hmm? So this is a very fundamental part of the, uh, of the process. Next time, we will continue with matrix that you can collect in your usability testing, because we are Definitely out of time.